Ha, good morning and praise God. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 12 which says, Don't let anyone look down upon you because you're young, but set a good example to the believers in speech, in love, in faith, and in purity. Welcome.
We thank him for his good. And there's none like you. He's so faithful and to live. And we bless him for his good. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Bless you, Jesus, for your appeal. Jesus. 
Jesus, it shall be a blessing to us, King of glory, to worship in your presence, King of glory. We pray that uh, we shall worship in truth and also in the spirit of our God. We dedicate this uh, program unto you, that as we commence and as we move on, you be glorified and magnified. In Jesus' name, we pray and all of us will say, Amen, Amen. Let's appreciate the Lord. Can we appreciate it, Jesus? Amen, Amen, Amen. Good morning once again. Uh, welcome to our first reading that is coming from the book of Luke. That is Luke chapter number 9, from verse uh, that, that 7 to 43. Luke number, uh, chapter number 9, from verse 37 uh, to 43. I guess we are there. Luke chapter number 9, from verse 37 to 43. And the comments begin. Now it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. Verse 38. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. Verse 39. And beyond a spirit sizes him. And he suddenly cries out. It confuses him so that he foams at mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty. Uh, brushing him was forty. So he poured your dis disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Verse 41. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and uh, facile generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here, verse 42. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and confused him. Uh, then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, held the child and gave him back to his father. Verse 43, that is the last verse. And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, that is the first reading. May the Lord praise his word. We continue to extend our greetings to all of you. It is always a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I thank God for this wonderful opportunity that he has given us to be here. He has given us the gift of life. He has given us same minds. And we thank him because it is by his purpose that we are here. A couple of weeks ago, we embarked on a study of the fall and the sinfulness of man. And we saw that in Genesis chapter 3, God arranged for man to be tempted in the area of appetite. We looked at appetite as one of the reasons why people eat. And concluded that we cannot live a victorious life if we do not control our appetites. We mentioned hunger and craving as other reasons why people eat. Next we looked at a special kind of craving that the Bible calls lust. And we define lust as a feeling of a strong desire for something or someone. We say that it is being caught after something or someone. And we read from the book of First John chapter 2 verse 16 and identified that lust takes three major forms. There is the lust of the flesh, which is living a life dominated by senses, a life that seeks self-gratification uh, of pleasures. And the second one is the lust of the eyes, this is desiring everything that we see, whether or not it is the will of God. And lastly, before time ran out, we mentioned the pride of life, which we defined as the arrogant spirit of self-sufficiency. We say that the pride of life seeks recognition, it seeks applause, it seeks status and advantage in life. 
It is the ungodly gratification of fleshly appetites, the gratification of mental satisfaction, and that egoistic arrogance. It is the feeling of being at the top, that feeling that you are already there, that feeling of feeling like you are ahead of the pack, being the best among us. That is the pride of life. And today we continue on that subject of the pride of life. And the title of the sermon that we are uh, looking at was The Spirit is Willing, but the Flesh is Weak. It is important to understand that salvation is an act of God. We get saved by believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In Acts chapter 16, the jailer asked Saul, uh, Paul and Silas, what can I do so that I can be saved? And the answer was, believe in the Lord and you shall be saved. Salvation is by no other name other than Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, whoever believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord shall be saved. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. And once we believe in Jesus, then God saves us. There is nothing that we can do to earn salvation. There is no good deed that we can do to attract God's uh, uh, attention so that he can save us. It is only by his grace that we are saved. And we are saved by faith in Christ Jesus. Why am I saying this? It is because sometimes when Christians are struggling with sin, it gets to a point and they feel like they are being weak Christians. It gets to a point and they start doubting their salvation. But I want to tell you this. Every Christian, every Christian, it does not matter how anointed you are. It does not matter how many verses you can quote. But every Christian struggles with sin every day of his life. It is normal to struggle with sin. And as long as we are in this body, we will struggle with sin. Because the flesh, the desires of the flesh are sinful. Human soul was corrupted when man fell. And ever since that corruption, that sin is in our DNA. Sin is a, a sin is in us. And Paul says that the, the flesh desires things that are contrary to the spirit. And the spirit desires things that are contrary to the flesh. In other words, the spirit and the flesh are in a constant battle. Elsewhere, he says in Romans that I do the things that I do not want to do. Meaning there are times that he finds himself being overtaken by the flesh. And this is the struggle that every Christian who is in the carnal body goes through. I came to tell you that it is normal to struggle with sin. And struggling with sin does not mean that you have fallen. In the passage that we have, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, it, is talk, it talks about these three elements that dominate our, our flesh. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And John says that these do not come from the Father. These come from the world. I invite you to the reading of God's word from the book of First John. Chapter 2. I will read verse 15 to 17. First John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the last of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Let us pray. 
Mighty and everlasting Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to hear your word. Father, I pray that you will open our ears, that we can hear your voice. Open our hearts, O oh Lord, that we can receive your word. And may your word dwell in us with a lot of richness. May it germinate, O oh God, in our hearts. May it lead us, may it guide us, may it change us and transform us. In the name of Jesus, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. So, as I have said, struggling with sin is normal. And what the apostle is trying to do here, he's writing to a people who are struggling with sin. If you look at the beginning of that chapter, chapter 2, John the apostle says, little children, I am writing these things to you so that you will not sin. He continues to say, but if you sin, we have an advocate before our God, who is Christ Jesus, the righteous one. So he's writing to people who ought not to sin. But he also he is, he is also alive to the fact that these people have the potential to sin. Because they are in the flesh, they may sin. And he brings out something here which is calling the love of God. That when you love God, you cannot sin. If you love the world, you will fall into temptations. And he says that you cannot love God and love the world. If you love the world, automatically you are not loving God. And therefore, these three things that he's bringing out are the consequences of someone who loves the world. So when someone loves the world, he is dominated by these three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And this is now contrary to what a, a Christian should be like. Because for a Christian to lead a victorious life, must live a life that is in love with God. You should love God so that you can overcome sin. If you, not if you do not love God, it automatically means that you are in love with the world. And if you love the world, the world will only offer these three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So John says that I'm writing these things to you so that you can understand the kind of battles that we are fighting. So that you can understand what God expects from you. So that you can understand how you should live so that you can lead a victorious life in Christ Jesus. The pride of life is when we are far, far more concerned with others' perceptions about us. We are living at an age where social media is dominating. And there are so many social media platforms. On average, a Kenyan has at least four. If you're not in Facebook, you are in WhatsApp, or you are in Twitter, or you are in um, LinkedIn, you are in Snapchat, you are in Instagram, and there's another one that is gaining momentum called TikTok. And there are so many of these platforms. And every time when someone posts, whether on Instagram or in Facebook or wherever, there is that innate feeling in them that they feel nice when more people like and comment. If someone puts a comment on Facebook and after one hour there is no like, there is no comment, they start doubting themselves. But when someone puts something there and in five minutes they have like a hundred likes or maybe a thousand comments, there is that feeling of I'm, I'm a celeb, I have control, I am leading, I am influential. It, 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 it gives you nothing but that self-satisfaction. That is what characterizes the pride of life. It is very empty. It has nothing in it. But it is very, it, it, it pumps air into you. The pride of life will not give you anything. But it is a craving that we have. And therefore, it is up to us to discipline our bodies and make them 
slaves to the spirit. Because if we do not conquer our bodies, we shall live a life that is dominated by the desires of the flesh. Paul talks to the Galatians and tells them, walk in the spirit, or rather be led by the spirit, and you shall not gratify the desires of the flesh. The only way that we can overcome the desires of our flesh is by walking by the spirit. There is no other way that we can conquer and overcome sin. If we love the world, we cannot overcome sin. We can only overcome sin if we love God and if we love his word. Allow me to read uh, from the same same book, First John uh, chapter 2. And verse 8. It says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, we are lying to ourselves. We are sinful. Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are sinful. We cannot say that we do not have sin. But we have a remedy. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And when he died on the cross, all our sins were forgiven. Our sins in the past, our sins in the present, and our sins in the future. All our sins were forgiven. And all we need to do every time that we realize that we are in sin is just to run to Christ for that forgiveness. We just claim that forgiveness. We are not going to beg for the forgiveness. It is already there. All our sins were forgiven. So we just need to confess our sins, run to Christ, and we get that forgiveness of our sins. Claiming that we do not have sin is making God to be alive. Claiming that we do not have sin is pride of life. It is like saying that we don't need God's salvation. It is like saying that we don't need the grace of life, uh, the grace of God. So, friends, I want to say this: that every Christian, every Christian struggles with, with, with sin. There are some conditions that are in us that we cannot overcome by our own. We can only rely on the grace of God to overcome. Moses was very successful in his ministry. He did a great job in his call. But he struggled with one thing that was called anger. And in the end, that is what costed him. He never reached the promised land because of his anger. Paul the Apostle says that God gave him a thorn in his flesh. He calls it a messenger of the devil to torment him. And he prayed to God to take away this thorn. But God said, I am not taking it out. You will live with it. But my grace is sufficient. Whatever struggles that we are going through, whatever struggles that we are struggling, whatever sins that are entangling us and pulling us down, I want you to know that it is normal to struggle with sin. But God has assured us victory that his grace will be sufficient. And even in our weaknesses, God will stand with us. God will enable us. And in the end, people will look at us and they will see the glory of God. Because God will glorify himself in our weaknesses. Even in the areas that we are struggling in, God will come through for us and he will glorify himself. Because it is all about him. It is all about his glory and honor. May the Lord bless you. May you lead a victorious life. I'd like to pray with you. I don't know what God has taught to you about this. I know people are going through so many things. There are so many unconfessed sins. Some are so dirty that we cannot even have the guts to confess. I don't know what is going on in you, in your mind and in your life, but you know yourself. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that the Spirit searches the hearts and the minds of men. There is nothing that is hidden before God. God knows us. We are just open 
before him. We are naked before his eyes. He knows us. He knows our deepest secrets. He knows our struggles. He knows our weaknesses. Whatever it is that is weighing you down, that thing that you cannot overcome, remember that God created you and God is sovereign and God has power over you. He knows that you are struggling in that area. And guess what? He still loves you. He knows that you are struggling with that sin, but he still loves you. And he's telling you this, that his grace is sufficient. If you say that you do not have sin, you are a liar. But if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive you and cleanse you of all that unrighteousness. And as I make this prayer, I want you to open your heart to God. Tell God to search your heart. Tell God just to point out the areas that you need to improve on. Anything that you need to improve on, just tell God to point it out to you and reach out to you and help you. Pray that the grace of God will be sufficient in your life. Father, we thank you and we honor you. Thank you for reminding us, O oh Lord, that in our carnality we will struggle with sin. We thank you, Lord, for the assurance that you have given us that all our sins are forgiven. And that, Lord, if you confess our sins to you, Lord, you are just and you are faithful. You shall forgive us and you shall cleanse us of all unfaithfulness. And, Lord Jesus, you know us. You who searches the hearts and the minds of men. Lord, you know us, O oh Lord. You know our deepest secrets, dear Lord. You know the struggles that we have. You know, Lord, even our fears and our worries, O oh God. The sins that we have harbored in our hearts for long. Dear Lord, you know them, King of Kings. And Lord, we come to you this morning acknowledging, Father, that we are not able to save ourselves from sin. We want to acknowledge, oh God, that it is only by your grace and your power that we can conquer and overcome sin. We thank you, Jesus Christ, because you conquered the world and you live in us, oh Lord. And we know that, Father, because you are in us, even the world, uh, even the sins, oh God, that entangle us are defeated in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray this morning that you shall come through for us, O oh God. We want to confess the sins that we are struggling with. We want to confess the sins, O oh Lord, that we have hidden and harbored in our lives. That, Lord, you are going to forgive us. That, Lord, you are going to rid us, O oh Lord, of all that unfaithfulness and uncleanness. Lord, may you help us to lead a life that is dominated and led by your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, even to fall in love with your word because your, Lord, your word gives light, O oh God, and it brings understanding even to the simple. We thank you, Father, because you're good and you're faithful to us. We honor you and bless your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. God bless you so much. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.